so to all of you, um, warmest, uh, warmest greetings. And uh, um, it, it's such a pleasure, Rabbi Rosen, to welcome you to the, uh, tonight's uh, lecture. And we're here with open heart and open mind. And to our um, adult education and learning committee, uh, people filled with curiosity and courage to explore and uh, to learn and stay open and awake. Uh, as you entered, I entered the Zoom just a few minutes before and um, had a chance to um, see your smiling face, your eyes, uh, and the light that was right behind you that came straight above your books uh, that were illuminated a bookshelf in a very special way. And um, um, just the thought of how much of our both inner enlightenment and um, light of knowledge come to us from an open book. And uh, just seeing a prayer book open in front of us is an invitation. So um, sometimes prayer is more than a light uh, before us. It is a light within us. A story is told about a rabbi who once entered a heaven in a dream. And it is Abraham Joshua Heschel who tell this lovely story. And uh, the story is told about the rabbi who was entered heaven in a dream. He was permitted to approach the temple of paradise where the great sages of the Talmud, the Tanaim, were spending their eternal lives. He saw that they were just sitting around tables studying the Talmud. The disappointed rabbi wondered if this is all there is to paradise. But suddenly he heard the voice, you are mistaken. The Tanaim are not in paradise. Paradise is in the Tanaim. So I would like to say welcome to you. And uh, Kim, if you can possibly possibly help us to open that door of paradise just a tiny bit wider. It will create an awareness, an openness, and deepen us as Jewish people and a Jewish soul. Welcome to Darhei Noam. Thank you very Lovely much. Too. Thank yeah. you very much. Unfortunately, I'm a sucker for jokes. And you've just, just reminded me of a, a joke I'm going to tell after the Talmud says that the rabbis used to make jokes before they started learning. So it's legitimate um, of uh, um, uh, a man who goes to the rabbi and he says, Rabbi, Rabbi, I'd like you to teach me Yiddish. And I said, Yiddish? What, what do you want to know Yiddish for, the rabbi said. He says, well, Rabbi, said, when I go to heaven, I'll have all these rabbis sitting around studying Gemara and they'll be speaking Yiddish. And I want to know what's going on. The rabbi turned to him and says, OK, but what happens if you go, go to heaven? He said, don't worry, Rabbi, I already do speak English. <laughs> <laughs> now, the serious subject of prayer, which is a subject I wrestled with for most of my life, because I find most prayer whether it's in a synagogue or in a church or wherever it may be, very disengaging. The very term prayer, which in English means to pray, to beg, to ask for, is something that in a sense I grapple with uh, because I ask myself, does God really need my prayers? And why am I praying? And what do I hope to get out of it? And I look around at what other people seem to, how they seem to respond to prayer. Um, and uh, I don't find that it makes much sense to me in the sense of asking. So I want to go down a different path. First of all, I want to say there is a fundamental difference between private prayer and public prayer. And I'm going to clarify that shortly. They are two very different species. One of them is a social phenomenon and the other is a personal phenomenon. There is an overlap, but often there isn't. So the question really is, um, what is the origin of prayer? In the Hebrew language, the word we use for prayer mainly is tefillah. And tefillah has an interesting root. It's a root, pe lamad lamad falel, which is to express oneself. 
And le hit palel is the hithil form, which means I'm expressing myself. I'm not just speaking or talking. I'm bringing something within me out. It's an expression. And there are different ways and different words that are used in the Torah to describe this process of lasiach, uh, lasuach, Ledaber, Likro, Litzok, to cry out to God, to appeal to God. And all the examples that we have in the Torah itself are of people appealing to God and, in a sense, saying what's worrying them and what's on their mind and what they want to get off their chest, so to speak. The word Lehit Palel also has a root, lefalel, which is plilim, judges. So lehit palel also means to judge oneself, to analyze oneself. So these are, if you like, at the root of the origin of prayer. And although the patriarchs and the matriarchs express their views to God, really the first example of genuine prayer as we might think it, is the mother of Samuel, Hannah, in that very, very beautiful expression when she goes to the tabernacle and she's there crying, pouring her heart out. The, the, the high priest who, who's there looks at her and thinks she's mad. You know, doesn't understand what she's doing, thinks she's drunk actually. Um, so uh, the origin of prayer in the Bible is quite different to what we think it is. There is no obligation in the Torah to pray. There's no law concerning prayer whatsoever. And in the early part of the evolution of the Jewish religion, it was a religion based on two things, family at home, what you do at home, and what you do in the sanctuary. And you go to the sanctuary for this uplifting sense of community. But you didn't really pray in the sanctuary. The high priest prayed for the people over you know, Yom Kippur. Um, the odd occasion, there was some time where they used to declare the Ten Commandments in the, in the temple. But by and large, it was not a place to pray. Prayer was something you did yourself at home. It was private between you and God. And therefore, in a sense, asking was not the issue, whereas expressing what is disturbing you, what is worrying you, what's upsetting you, that is what really counts. And I'm going to spend a little bit of time talking about tefillah, the development of it in the Talmud. But when it comes to Maimonides, a thousand years ago, Maimonides said this very clearly. He said, there is an obligation in the Torah for each one of us to try to relate to God in any way we can. And this is prayer as far as the Torah is concerned. The prayer that we now have is the community prayer, which was introduced by the rabbis when the temple, by and large, disappeared as a way of getting the community together, because what else was going to keep them together at that time if the temple wasn't there anymore? And that's where you began, in response to the collapse of the temple, to create a new development in Judaism. The first was the idea of study, so that when the Jews were exiled and went to Babylon, they had the idea of a Beit Knesset, which is a place where you gather together. And if you gather together, what are we going to do there? Well, at that stage, they thought the thing to do there, what we've got, the only text we have is Torah text in whatever form it was. It's a place where you go to study. And others said, no, it's a place you go to be together. And there in Babylon, you begin to develop two locations, the place where you study, and the place where you gather with your friends. And in gathering in their friends, that's when the rabbis started to introduce these three prayers, morning, afternoon, and evening, in a very simple form, and then slowly evolved over the next five, six hundred years. And there was a debate in the Talmud. 
what is more important? Is prayer more important or is study more important? One section of the rabbi said studying is much more important because if you study, you will know more and that will encourage you to practice more. In the end, it's practice that counts. So we want to make study the most important thing. So whatever you do, don't give up study to go and pray. Others said, no, 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 no. Praying is the most important because it connects you with God directly. And so you have this debate. Some rabbis left the study house to study, to, to pray, and some didn't. So this is the origin, about 2,000 years ago, of the prayers that we have today. And when you look at the service that emerged after all this time, it was made up of essentially three sections. What is called prayer, tefillah, just applies to the 18 benedictions, the Amidah, which was created by the rabbis as a kind of a menu of ideas that relate to our past, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, relate to the importance of life and the sort of things we're worried about, our health, our brains, the, uh, our state of mind, the state of the world, these kind of issues and agenda, which we were expected to just select what we felt like. On this day, I'm going to think about my health. This day, I'm going to think about passing an exam. Whatever it was, it was designed as a kind of a menu. But before that, they introduce what is called the Shema. Shema is not prayer. It's Kriyat Shema. It's reading a three paragraphs from the Torah. And that was introduced to balance prayer and say, look, we've got to study a bit, so let's study a bit, and we'll say the Shema. Then you added another element that came after, which was the weekly reading of the Torah, which was also part of the importance of education. So education is basically, after the destruction of the temple, what kept us going and what kept us alive and still does. This combination was then added to over time, added here, added there, and largely because in medieval times, both in the Sephardi, the Oriental world and the Occidental world, the synagogue probably was the only decent building in town. Most people were living in hovels, and sometimes in hovels in which the family and the animals were all together and homes were, were smelly places without sort of proper sewage or whatever it was. And the synagogue was a wonderful place to go to. And they wanted to spend as much time there as they could. So what are they gonna do when they're there? They're not gonna play mahjong or some chess or anything like that. You add some more information, some more Psalms, uh, a bit more study, a bit more of that. And the other reason why they were there is because very often that was security. They were there in groups so they could defend themselves and leave together and come together in whatever way. So for all these reasons, they extended the period of services, extended them, and in some cases, going on for hours. Now, most people don't have patience for that. But not only at the time of the Talmud, the Talmud always used to, famous case in the Talmud of Rabbi Akiva, in which they say, Rabbi Akiva, when he was praying in the synagogue as the cantor, as the rabbi, he ran through it very, very quickly. But when he was praying to himself, he was the last person left there, dragged out longer. They said, why are you doing this? He said, because I don't like the idea of troubling the community. And if I go on for too long, people get bored. And not only that, but one of the reasons why the reading from the Torah at that time was much longer on Shabbat than it was on festivals was because, says the Talmud, on festivals, people would want to go home to have a big meal with their family and get there, not spend too much time in the synagogue, so we're not going to hold them back too much. So you see the mentality here. The mentality here is that synagogue is a place where you come together, where you have a kind of a format, a prayer book, which is in a way just a guidebook. It doesn't have to be slavishly followed. And it's somewhere which should provide an experience of community and pleasure together. But the sort of prayer that we think prayer should be is still and remains a very personal thing, even though most people try to combine the two nowadays, it's easier to do it that way. Now, 
always going through, certainly from the Babylonian exile, there was a mystical dimension. And the mystical dimension was always something that was personally orientated rather than communally orientated. So you didn't have this idea of the Kabbalist being part of the broader sections of society, but really creating a little world of his own into which people were invited. They didn't just turn up and come, they were invited into these inner circles. And long before the Kabbalah, which we know now as the source of, of mysticism, but really it only appeared about a thousand years ago in Spain, there were lots of examples beforehand of people doing what we would call mystical things, whether it was Shimon Bar Yochai in his mystical retreat in the cave, or whether it was Rabbi Akiva going into this uh, kind of orchard of mysticism. It was very, very personal and consisted of essentially two areas of interest. One of them was what is essentially uh, called the, the palace, was how does the world work? Um, how do we understand it? What does God mean? How do we relate to God? What are we supposed to do to get closer to God? Merely reciting prayers isn't going to do anything, not really. So one part of it was trying to understand the world, and the other part was trying to understand ourselves. How do we work? And these two strains helped eventually to lead to what became known as the Hasidic or the mystical way of praying. Up until that moment, up until actually it suffered in the 16th century, where song comes in for the first time into prayer, because previous to that, they banned singing because they were still mourning for the temple. So the mystics introduced the idea of singing. They introduced the idea of leaving the synagogue and going out into the hills and praying in the hills, breaking out of structures. And this was the great innovation of mysticism that transformed prayer from a very routine thing into something ecstatic. So you have within the Judaism that's developed in our time, these two kinds of, shall we say, expressions of prayer within Judaism, the ecstatic and the more structured, the more ones that we are familiar with in most of the communities, whether it is uh, conservative, reform, or orthodox, they have these structured synagogues where there is a set format and people come in and they do their thing and they do their duties and then they disappear and go home. And in a sense, put religion away until the next time. Whereas in effect, the home is the most important part. And why aren't we praying in home all the time, a lot of the time, much of the time? And in fact, the Kabbalists also introduced, Abraham Abu Lafia particularly, introduced the idea of what we call meditation and even of yoga exercises. And not only that, but in the Talmud itself, they comment on the fact that rabbis took uh, an hour preparing themselves before they went to pray. What were they doing then? Well, they were meditating, they were contemplating. They were doing things that we can do at home in addition to whatever we might be doing in, in the synagogue as well. So all of these, in a sense, are tools. And these tools have evolved over time and they are continuing to evolve. And we should not be bound by, it's always done this way. Now, it's very important to keep tradition alive and it's very important not to cancel things we don't like, to keep texts as they are with all the things we find problematic, but to move beyond that and over that to something new. So therefore, let's examine for a moment what we do when we pray. Now, one of the things we do when we pray, which is very close to what we do when we give a blessing, 
one of the things we do, just want to check I'm not going on for too long here. Um, one of the things we do is we express our feelings. When I bless my child, I'm saying, God, I really hope that things are going to be okay. Now, I don't think for one minute that God's going to protect my boy or my daughter and prevent them from getting ill or falling into a trap or making the wrong decisions or screwing up their lives. I don't think God is Superman and going to intervene. If he did, of course, why didn't he intervene in all those times when he should have intervened all the time? And how come good people are suffering and bad people are doing well? So I don't think of God as Superman in the sky. Rather more, I think of God, if I would have to, as a kind of a friend I want to have a chat with, a kind of an analyst in space, if you like, somebody that I can express myself to. So I don't expect God to solve my problems or to answer me. Some people do. Now, there's a lot of debate and a lot of discussion about placebos and about faith healing. And these are things which are not rational, they're not logical, and yet they work for people. And the fact is, some people need this sense of emotional support. Some people need this idea of something to combat one's egoism, to explore other spiritual areas. So for all these reasons, I think that each one of us chooses that aspect of prayer that suits our temperament, that suits our background, and we find a way of dealing with it. And the role of the synagogue, in my opinion, is to provide options, is not only to have one format, but to experiment with other formats too, and include them in the overall spiritual experience. And above all, I think the function of prayer is for us to ask ourselves, who are we? So throughout the Torah, when God engages with anybody, the response of the Torah is to say, Hineni, here I am. Look, I'm an open vessel, an open book. I, I'm willing to hear. I'm willing to study. I'm willing to do whatever it takes to make me a better person and a better Jew. And this is what prayer does. And prayer also has this final in ingredient, this sense that one is not alone, that even though it's very difficult to articulate one's relationship with God, it is a feeling that one is not alone, that one can have this sense of support, almost of friendship, as we go through life trying to struggle with the challenges that we all face. So that's my presentation. I've rattled on for long enough. I'm now going to go to the questions and simply ask them. So the first question is, um, from Eric, can you elaborate the difference in the concept of prayer in Torah, Nevi'im, and Ketuvim? So to recap, really, Torah, it is simply expressing what I want, what matters to me. In the prophets, prayer is more a matter of why are people screwing up so badly all the time? How can I get them to behave better? This is a mess. I want to heal the world. I want to repair it. And when you come to then the Talmudic period, the period of the rabbis, which we're closest to in one sense, it has this dual function of something that gets us to come together on the one hand, and something that encourages us to reach out to God on the other. Uh, Riddell asks, when an individual reaches out to God with prayer, should she expect an answer of some kind? We read in the Torah direct communication between our patriots and God, and Moshe Rabbeinu and the prophets. Um, when I express my confusion to God, am I foolish to expect an answer? Well, I think if you expect an answer in the sense that when you go to a doctor, you want a diagnosis, or you want an answer in that sense, then uh, I don't feel 
that that is the best use one can make of God. Because if you think for a moment, however you want to interpret God, whether you interpret God as getting involved or not getting involved, think of all the millions of people around the world who are appealing to God. You know, I can't help laughing when I watch the, the World Cup soccer. Um, before every game, either somebody was on the ground praying to Allah, or somebody was crossing himself going to Jesus, or somebody else was waving up at the sky and something else. They're all asking God to help them win the soccer game. As if God's got nothing better to do, so to speak, than help people win soccer games. And everybody is asking, you know, the Palestinians are asking God to help them. The Israelis, Jews are asking God to help them. This is everybody is. So I don't know how one can get an answer other than this. That when you face something like this ineffable, intangible phenomenon that we call God, and I do it sometimes simply by closing my eyes and looking into the black and white fire of cloud in my closed eyes and relaxing to the point where by expressing what I want, I get clarity. And in that sense, it's the clarity that gives me feedback that enables me to cope. So God is helping me cope rather than answering my questions. That's how I understand it. But the truth is, everybody, in a sense, finds their own route to God. Um, Esther asks, why is it important to leave the text alone and not modify, which is uncomfortable? Aren't we able to evolve in our understanding and relationship with God? Well, look, the simple answer is this. Should we tamper with the text of Shakespeare? We have the folio of Shakespeare, it is a text. We can argue about who wrote it, whether it was Shakespeare who wrote it or whether it was um, uh, some of the other contemporaries of his at the time, Marlowe and uh, uh, Webster, whether they did or not. We can tinker around now in the news with Raoul Dahl, that ghastly anti-Semite. And should we change the text? I don't believe in doctoring texts. Because if you doctor text, you are changing a text to something you're seeing at this particular moment in your particular way. You're not seeing it as an important historical document, as an important artifact. So I am completely against tinkering around with texts. I am in favor of adding other texts. So add whatever else you want to but don't destroy what's been part of our heritage for thousands of years. So I understand that what's in this text of uh, traditional Judaism is both sexist, uh, to some extent, uh, you might even say it's barbaric in certain respects. Uh, when I pray, shall we say, in my tradition for rebuild the house of David, return the kingdom of David, I'm not interested in a monarchy. And I don't think the house of David was all that good or that David was the perfect king. I just treat this as taking me back to my past, a little bit of a nostalgia, reminding me of where I come from. But there are certain things within the established prayers that uh, appeal to me more than others. And as I say, I find things that appeal to me rather than focus on what I don't like in a text. And if there's a text I don't like when I'm praying, I skip it. If I'm not in the mood to say it, I don't say it. Sometimes I am, sometimes I aren't. But I don't think that censorship is a good idea. And I don't think trying to tinker with text is a good idea. By all means, divide your services into two parts, for example, one part tradition, the other part innovative. Why not? Um, is the mysticism a direct conflict with Mordechai Kaplan's reconstructionist thought? The mysticism seems to be a renewal import. Well, it's very interesting, you know, sort of, there's a famous crack about mysticism. It starts in a mist and it ends in a schism. And mysticism can be very dangerous. And that's one of the reasons why the rabbis were not so happy about publicizing it and spreading it around. Um, and on the other hand, uh, Kaplan was, great man, but a rationalist. 
I'm a rationalist. I studied philosophy at Cambridge and rationalism matters to me, but I have another side to me, the emotional side, which is irrational. You can't say that love is rational, but people do it. And I think that mysticism in controlled doses is an important ingredient in your religious armory. Unfortunately, too much of mysticism is hocus pocus. Too much of mysticism today in Kabbalah centers and others is, is, is frankly just self-help, blah, blah. And if it works for people in the placebo effect, well, good luck. But it's not the serious thing. It's the equivalent, if you like, of Mickey Mouse cartoons to serious literature. And so uh, it's uh, mysticism has its place. It definitely has its place, in my opinion but it has to be something that is controlled and structured and studied and not just treated like astrology, you know, look up easy answers in a quick fix of some kind. Uh, Mark asks, if a modern function of prayer is to create a communal moment, what can we do for the content of practice of prayer in Jewish society in which people understand the language of prayer until our reading, fewer participating in this communing? Well, I, you know, that's why I believe one should try to find something that's going to appeal to them. Uh, for example, why can't we have a service divided, shall we say, into a time when we're having a little bit of teaching, a sermon, if you like, where we're studying something, some of the time when we're singing something, some of the time when we're reading something. Now, this goes on in many communities, and many communities do make and create their own atmosphere. So um, if something is not working, my answer is try something else. Um, Bishop of Exeter, what I can't say, but I must say, I sing. Well, you know, sing is also good, but some people don't sing. For some people, music doesn't work. Some people are tone deaf. And, and that's why I think we have to personalize it much more. Um, and, and to me, the, the social side and the educational side are more important than prayer. You see, the fact is that we've been influenced, in my view, too much by Christianity. And we think of synagogue as church. And the fact is that that approach takes religion out for Sunday or for Saturday and then puts it back for the rest of the week. Whereas I think what goes on in the home during the week is just as important, if not more important, than what's being taken out on, on a Saturday. And therefore, we think of the church in terms of music, entertainment, uh, preaching, and things of this kind, which don't always work for everybody. They work for some people, but we mustn't neglect those for whom it's not working. Um, so at some level, you could say, the average church service of praying to God and asking for the things that we ask for is very similar in Judaism. It's very similar in Islam. The differences are cultural differences. The beauty of Jewish prayer, which is based not solely, but significantly on Hebrew, creates a bond between Jews all around the world. Whereas if you only have it in the country, in the language of your origin, somebody from China or somebody from Russia or somebody from America won't understand each other in church, in, in synagogue. The beauty of Hebrew originally was it did. Of course, Catholicism originally had Latin bringing everybody together, and then it now has reformed it and taken it away. And so you can pray, have mass in any language. But there's a lot to be said for cohesion again. And that is one of the ingredients in cohesion. Um, and so what makes Jewish prayer different is not the actual act of appealing to God or Allah, which is the same, but how you do it and what way you do it, which identifies you as a Jew. Um, do I have any more? Mayor Simotetsky. Oh, that's a famous name. Um, oh, yeah, that's the one I've just read. So we dealt, dealt with that. So I think I've covered everything. Does anybody want to add anything else? Shall I hand back to the authorities that be? Well, I think I will uh, join in at this point um, to thank you. And thank you very much 
Rabbi Rosen, um, that was a wonderful history of prayer. Uh, the links in which uh, to which I I never really understood before. So, for that, for me, thank you very much. Uh, clearly, you uh, um, you were uh, very uh, informative and authoritative. You only got seven questions. <laughs> when I was president, everybody argued with everything I said all the time. So clearly, I didn't live up to your standards. Uh, synagogue business, no business like it. <laughs> in any event, thank you very much for taking the time and uh, sharing your wisdom with us tonight. Uh, it was quite a wonderful um, session. And so thank you very much from all of us. It was my pleasure. I'm glad meeting you, everybody. Um, from the organization, the leadership, the rabbi, and um, may you have a very happy Adar, full of joy, with Purim in a couple of weeks' time, and if you do drink, drink one for me. Thank you. <laughs> Bye. Thank you.